Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I was searching the web recently and came across an interesting gentleman who has been studying and looking into Islam for a long time. And I said, hey, why don't we do a show and talk about what he means by political Islam? Before we do, let's have our intro. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have been taking a closer look at the religion of Islam because it is a monotheistic religion, which I've been researching the other previous two, predate it. And I said, let me find out more about it. And I hear um, so many different ideas and people come on with different opinions. So today we're going to have Dr. Bill Warner join us today. How are you doing, Bill? Doing for well. And we're going to be doing my favorite thing. We're going to be talking about political Islam. So we're going to have a good time. Awesome. Before we get started doing that, he has a website. If you guys are interested in checking it out, whether you hate the guy or love the guy, politicalislam.com. And also he has a YouTube channel, Political Islam. You can subscribe and hit that bell. Last of all, as my soup or my patron, you guys join that. You can ask me questions about upcoming guests and things. Um, I interview scholars in person with high definition cameras, and these are recordings, for example, from patron members who've asked questions. High definition. This is another one. This is another one. And I mean, there's mostly those kind of recordings. Then there's also Dr. Shadi Nasir interviews, and I've done a bunch of those on Islam and understanding, you know, the origin of the Kaaba. If I'm saying that right. Uh, what are Muslim scholars hiding? There's some things that cause doubt even within the Muslim community that scholars in Islam are hiding. Quran borrows from the Bible, you know, burn all the variants, different interesting conversations that we can have. But today, Dr. Bill Warner is going to take us into this. I want you guys to know if you're interested in having a question asked, we only have 60 minutes. His voice gives up after that. And we're going to close things out at one hour. If you have questions, super chat your questions. And I will try my best, of course, to get to those questions and have Dr. Warner answer them. My first question to you, we're coming out the gate guns blazing, Bill. Are you a bigot? Well, that all depends on who you ask. If you ask the Southern Poverty Law Center, one time I was one of America's top 10 bigots. How about that? Wow. Be top 10 in anything nationally. However, when you ask the question, well, what do you mean when he says he's a bigot? Well, you look, the more you look at it, the more you realize, well, everything he says is based on the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad. That is, I only talk about what's in the Quran and what Muhammad said and did, and also my knowledge of Sharia. So what they mean is, is what I say irritates some Muslims. That's what a bigot is. Okay. So technically, to many Muslims, you're a bigot. Right. Do you, have, do you know Muslims personally who don't think you're a bigot, but they disagree with you? You know, I don't, don't know. Have, you don't have many Muslim friends, I suspect. Well, I used to, I've had, I have Muslim friends. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons I wound up learning so much about Islam was, uh, let me give you a brief history. I'm 80 years old and I started my study of Islam when I was 30, 50 years ago. I started wow. studying Sufism. And because I was told Sufism was Western mysticism. Well, that wasn't quite true. And I began to suspect there were some things that were dark shadows in the corners that nobody wanted to talk about. So I left Sufism. And those things that were dark and in the corner were basically jihad and Sharia. So that stayed that way. And then I, I have a doctorate in physics. So I started teaching at a local university. And many of my students were Muslims. I was very casual in my approach to teaching. And so people would stop by my office and talk. As a matter of fact, one Muslim kept coming by my office to talk. He wanted to convert me. And so I, I found him interesting to talk to because I would ask him interesting questions, which made him go, hmm. Right. So I started reading the Quran cover to cover instead of just here and there. And then I read Muhammad's life. As a result, on September 11, 2001, my phone began to ring off the wall with people saying, and you, you said something was going to happen. How did you know? I read the playbook. When Osama bin Laden called America to Islam, I went, oops, we're going to get whacked. Why? Because Muhammad had called his, called his enemies to Islam before he attacked them. Get this. His favorite time was a sneak attack in the morning against a financial institution. Does that sound like anything that could have happened at the World Trade Towers? Interesting. 
So people thought I was smart, but all I'd done was just simply, it was like we're playing football and I had the other team's playbook. So here's what they're going to do. So that's how I got into it. Then I realized I lived in a country that didn't know Buddhism from Hinduism to Zoroastrianism or anything else. And so I knew this was going to be an ideological war. And so I set about the task of making all of Islam's books, that is the Quran, which you've heard about, the Sirah, which is his biography, and the Hadith, which are his traditions, make those very clear so that other people could speak on the basis of natural knowledge of the doctrine, not what some expert said. So you're looking at the sources to come That's up with. That's all I deal with. Okay. And let me ask you this. Do you do you come up against a lot of difficulty on them saying, well, you don't read Arabic or you don't understand what you're talking about. So really all of these claims that you're making, you have no substance because you're just reinterpreting it to make them look bad. How do you respond to that? I find it interesting that they claim the Quran's the only book that's universal in its coverage, but not understandable by anybody who doesn't read Arabic. And by the way, if that's true, there are very few Muslims in the United, in the world today because very few Muslims speak Arabic. Many more speak Urdu, for instance, than speak Arabic. Besides that, isn't it kind of peculiar that a universal religion would have something that can't be understood except in a local language? Doesn't make sense, does it? I agree, actually. I thought about this the other night. That's why I brought the question to you, because I'm sure you've caught, you've probably heard everything under the sun. Uh, oh, by the you. way, I love it to give, I used to give a lot of talks in public, and I loved it when Muslims would come to the talks and ask me questions, and one of them said just what you said. I says, I'm going to give you a challenge right now. You say I can't understand the Quran because <clears throat> I don't read an Arab. <clears throat> don't read Arabic. See, there's my voice. And you say that I can't understand the Sarah because I don't read Arabic. I challenge you right now to give me a verse I cannot explain to you out of the Quran. I challenge you to show me a hadith which I cannot understand and explain to you. And I challenge you to show me a chapter of the Sarah which I can't understand. Show me now. He said, I'm going to shut up. So you've caught some crap. You've been doing this for 50 years. I've caught, I've caught my fair share. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet. And I mean, I could tell you're pretty bold. So you're, 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 you seem very kind, but also very blunt. And I think the bluntness is what's caused a lot of people to think this guy doesn't like me. Um, we talked right before I hit record. We only had like three minutes to chat, uh, three to five minutes. And we talked about uh, warm water, cold water. And I said, well, but, but Bill, we know this to be true. I know some Muslim friends. They are ignorant of the things you're saying. So technically, if I can be as honest as I can, they're not thinking the guys I put on the thumbnail to make this video that have weapons. They're like, no, we don't like them. In fact, I know some Muslims who say we hate jihadists, or if you will, we hate the um, the Islamic State that we see, what's going on with the Taliban, what's happening with ISIS. We hate those guys. We need help combating those guys. And they're reinterpreting things to be mystical or allegory, or they're saying, no, that doesn't mean that. She wasn't a prepubescent girl or or the Kaaba, whatever it might be, there's something they're reinterpreting. So I pitch it to you to say, are all Muslims the same? And if not, can you just can you give us some differences on what you what you've walked away with? Well, anyone who reads the <clears throat> anyone who reads the Quran says it's contradictory. As a matter of fact, it's so contradictory, it gives rules called abrogation to straighten out the confusion. And the rule of abrogation is very simple. The later verse is better and stronger than the earlier verse. Here's the trouble. And by the way, I use the word dualism for this instead of abrogation because it turns out the same thing is true in the Hadith. Let me give you an example. Muhammad said, do not strike Allah's handmaidens. In other words, don't hit women. Then another Hadith says, never ask a man why he beats his wife. Well, wait a minute, which is it? Beat her or don't beat her? That's dualism. And the same thing is true about the Quran. So what happens is when you read the Quran in the right time sequence, you've never read the Quran unless you read it in the right time order. All the good stuff is written early. The bad stuff, which is what Allah says to do, is written later. So it's a contradictory book. But instead of trying to figure out which side is the right side, we need to embrace the contradiction we're so wedded to Aristotelian logic that if two things contradict each other, at least one of them must be false. But Islam does not run on that logic. 
they're both con they contradict each other so you can have two muslims one very peaceful and the other one blowing himself up in a car and they're both muslims but the jihadi muslim is stronger the jihadi muslim if he dies in the commission of jihad gets to skip the punishment of the grave and gets to skip judgment day so when i do you see what i mean when i stronger you can go to heaven as a muslim but if you're a jihadist you get you can you you, you go straight to the top mm -hmm. so therefore i call islam dualistic it's is it what is it peaceful yes it is is it violent you bet but which is it i say it's like having hot water and cold water at the sink is the hot water more real than the cold water no you turn on the tap for the one you need and i'm well acquainted with the fact that many muslims don't like the jihadis they think that isis is terrible but let me state this there's not one thing that isis does that's Islamic State. There's not one thing it does that's not found within the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad. And we need to define a word here. What is Islam? Islam is the doctrine found in the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith. Period. End of discussion. You may be an expert, but Muhammad is a better expert than you are. So the experts we need to ask about Islam are not your friendly neighbor who's a Muslim. But instead we need to say what is, because if he says something that Muhammad agrees with, then he's correct. If he says something that Allah disagrees with, then he's wrong. So, so let's skip the Muslim and go straight to Muhammad and Allah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's it's the same thing that Christians do as an example. I'll give one example. If Christians go out and do something really bad, like burn people alive back in the day for the Trinity, right? Most Christians are on the same page by saying they weren't living like Christ, right? They weren't obeying the words of Christ. Why would they go and do that? Now, whatever your opinion of Christendom is, the point is you go back to the text and they're right. I mean, it doesn't carry those kind of um, tendencies in the New Testament to go and kill or do these things. It does show a kind of a, um, you know, persecution. I'd rather die, right? Carry your cross, go turn the other cheek, these concepts. So um, it's foundation is based on these kind of principles, whereas you're suggesting that if you go back into the Quran, you're going to find some of those pretty concepts, but you're also going to find more militant kind of concepts as well. Um, let's talk about what you thought the development of Islam comes from. We talked about pre-Islamic Arabic pagan uh, culture, Judaism and Christianity, and Zoroastrianism. Do you think some of its military complex, like the idea that it has about battling and warfare is coming from some specific culture more than others, or is it just where this is at, when it's dated to where it began, that this kind of uh, idea is happening? Does that make sense? Say it to me briefly. So simply put, the idea that we see an aggressive conquest, <clears throat> constant warfare, even right. down into today, like what we see going on in Afghanistan, Right. right. Is this built into the ideology of these? Yes. Texts? Yes, it is. Look, Muhammad is the perfect human being. The Quran says 89 verses that every Muslim is to imitate what Muhammad did and said. Can you be more clear than that? Well, it turns out that one of the things he's he, that Muhammad himself was involved in 108 acts of jihad. Notice when I speak, I give you a lot of statistics. Right. So that's the that's the true nature of it. Yes, it's involved in jihad, and yes, it's involved in being a good neighbor. But we need to face this. When Muhammad moved to Medina after he was driven out of Mecca, three years after he moved there, every, every Arab in the town was Muslim, and the Jews had been driven out. So that's the nature of Muhammad. Hmm. This is heavy. You do know that what you're saying does not sit well with the far left in the America. <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what's our what's our problem? What's going on? What I mean, look, I don't I don't think it's I think there's good people in every religion. I really do. I honestly think that. I think people are just typically good until they're told, "Hey, believe in this book that's 1400 years old or whatever, and you really need to stick to the guidelines of that text for what it says." And um I guess the question is we're not really looking at this politically in the West. Because, sure, they're the minority here. But if you were to go into a country, or let's just say it started to take over America, could you easily predict what would happen if Islam became the predominant uh, religion in, this, uh, in the United States? Well, look at Syria. Look at Lebanon. Look at North Africa. Look at Egypt. They all used to be Christian. 
No more. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I mean, history gives us a guide. This is not a new experiment. It's been done for 1400 years. As a matter of fact, the first recorded writings in which uh, Islam is mentioned are Christian documents, and they mention violence. Now the Saracens came out of the desert and killed and looted and took over. Let me, let me point out something here. You keep using the word religion. I only use the word political Islam, and here's what I mean by that. As a scientist, I precisely define my terms. It is political if it deals with the Kafir, the non-Muslim, and that's the proper word. If it deals with the Kafir, it cannot be religious because the Kafir is outside of the religion. So everything that deals with outside of the religion of Islam that impacts the Kafir, I call political Islam. And if you count the words in Quran, Sirah Hadith, you discover that 84% of them are about Muhammad, which is odd, but 51% of them are about the Kafir. So it's, Islam is more of a political doctrine than a religious doctrine. I don't give a flip about the religion of Islam. I don't, I'm not attracted to it. It's heaven. I'm not afraid of its hell. But I'm very afraid of Sharia because under Sharia, you and I are supposed to be dhimmis, D-H-I-M-M-I-S. And that means we're to be subjugated and humiliated. That it concerns me a lot. Let me give you an example of how it's the subtle the difference is between religion and politics. It's very customary in, in Europe on Friday for Muslims to commandeer the street and do public prayers. You say, well, they have to do that. It's a religion. They have to pray. But when they barricade the street, commandeer the street, that is political. You see the difference? Mm. So there's definitely a, a, a almost no fine line. Because I know when you go into antiquity, politics and religion, you know, they do coincide. It's not like yes. a separation of church and state. So we obviously have to think, if we're thinking one, there is somehow the other involved. And you're saying in Islam, they're both married together. They are one flesh the whole way through. Is that what yes. you're suggesting? But all I talk about is, I don't talk about whether what well, a Muslim does is right religiously. I just say these are the complications of the Muslim when they move in, and that complication is called Sharia. Hmm. Interesting. Well, if you guys are interested in super chatting a question, feel free to ask along the way. We only have 40 minutes left, and I have a very limited amount of time because his voice will give out. Um, but look, I there's so many things that you've talked about. I'm, I could see why they see you as a problem. I don't mean that as a bad thing. I mean, I'm just saying you're very I'm super rational. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, but you're very serious about this. Oh yeah. And, and that's what gets you into trouble. It seems. Well, if you're not in trouble, you're not doing your job. <laughs> Were you in the military ever? No. Okay. You sound like, you know, a few military people in, in, Oh, I do. Yeah. I know retired policemen, retired FBI, green berets, Oh, my father is a retired Green Bray, actually. So he was good for him and good for you. Yes, the remarkable people. Yeah. When I was teaching in college, I discovered that the elite troops, the Green Berets and other such people, when they came back to school, were excellent students and were highly intelligent. I mentioned this to a friend of mine. He said, yes, all the elite troops are more intelligent than the average schmuck. Hmm. I'll tell my dad you said that. He'll feel really good about himself. <laughs> tell, him, tell, him, tell him I'm proud of him. Yeah, well, I'm, I mean, look, I'm very proud of him. He's a huge hero of mine as well. And uh, yeah, I learned a lot from him. And In fact, I was in uh, Afghanistan in 2010 doing contract work. And then I went through Kuwait. And I saw uh, a lot of people, you know, it's a totally different world. I never had been exposed to this until I went there. And I was in uh, Kuwait in 2010. And um, the Kuwaiti citizens are all dressed in white. They kind of have the Aladdin outfits and right. uh, they have a lot of people they hire in from other countries, I think, to come do all the small work for them. And they're running businesses. But uh, they had Lamborghinis, Ferraris, all of these things just all over the place. And so I, this the first time I ever smoked from a hookah. You know, they, they have hookahs at restaurants and I'm just hanging out and having fun. But um, but yeah, I actually met a few Muslims when I was there. And I'll tell you a quick story uh, just just for fun. They were cleaning the bathrooms on Bagram, Afghanistan base. And uh I was working in the mailroom, so I was able to sneak alcohol at the time. So I'm a little buzzed, and I'm just uh, having fun. I go to use the restroom, and there's a whole group of guys that are cleaning the restroom. And I start having small talk because one of them could speak English. And I said, man, honestly, 
you got to answer this question. And he's like, what? And I said, how many wives do you have? And he said, three. And I said, how do you do it? We can barely handle one in America, you know, joking with him. And we laughed and stuff. But um, I, I, I really empathize when an ideology like that is kind of uh, poisoning people. I mean, what would Muslims think if they entered the mind of someone that is the Taliban in Afghanistan? Like, what would they think? You know, would they be like, actually, in their mind, they're right and you're wrong? Right. I well, mean, remember, I, I'm aware, both. I'm well aware of both sides of the uh, lifestyle. That is, there are many Afghanis you will meet who will be just perfectly fine people. As a matter of fact, the first Afghani I ever met was when I was in graduate school. Wonderful people. They didn't mind a beer or two either. Let me assure you. But I know a woman who married an Afghan here in America, and she was a woman's. She was a women's liber. liber. And so when she got to Afghanistan, she said, when his foot hit the tarmac, he became a man I did not recognize. Everything about him changed. His tone of voice, he confiscated my passport. She managed to sneak out of the country years later by working through the British embassy. So here we see the two faces of Islam. And by the way, his deception of her, Muhammad was a great deceiver. Allah was a, is the greatest of deceivers. So deception is part of Islam. I, I don't think I've had anyone on my channel that has said anything so bold. And uh, I'm just telling you what's there. I'm just telling you what's written. Wow. So can you back up what you're saying? All right. How is Muhammad and how is Allah the greatest deceiver? And I mean, is this a practice that they're supposed to deceive? Is that what you're suggesting? Yes. We know in the Sarah, which is a biography, Muhammad repeatedly advised Muslims to deceive. Who will kill Ashraf? Who is going to, who is going to harm Allah and his prophet? I will, Muhammad, but first I will have to deceive him. May I do so? Yes, deceive him. So the man deceived Ashraf and killed him. That's, a, that's part of the Sirah and the Hadith. Hmm. Remember, he's the perfect man. So if he advises deception, then it is acceptable to deceive. But only to advance Islam. He's not supposed to, to deceive you if he's selling you a used car. But you see here, once you're into the deception business, how things can get kind of blurred at the edges. Yeah, I could see that. We have a couple people in the chat. I got a Muslim uh, right here, Truth and Knowledge. He's been on my channel before. He says, it's not bold. It's just hateful rhetoric. He thinks what you're saying is just hateful, right? It's not It's not factual, right? I mean, I guess that's well, what Well, he's coming from his point. Yeah, let's explain something here. Slander under the Sharia is not a false statement. Sh slander under Sharia is a, a statement that a Muslim does not like. Hmm. So he's coming from the Sharia, and he's accurate under the Sharia. Muslims are never, uh, Kafirs are to never offend Muslims. That's part of their humiliation. By the way, there are 13 verses in the Quran. Do you notice all the numbers I'm bringing to you? Yeah. There are 13 verses in the Quran which state that the, the Muslim is never the true friend of the Kafir. That's what Allah says. Think about that for a while. And nothing's lower than... Uh, Kafirs are lower than animals. Allah hates Kafirs, despises Kafirs, makes them to make, creates Kafirs in order to burn them in hell. So, what do you think happened? I mean, do you think that? Uh, I mean, it's probably a simple answer, but I'm asking because I have a lot of people from the West, or they're not in is in an Islamic state, that are chatting in our chat right now, that are watching this video right now, and they're in a friendly, safe, Westernized world where they're not thinking. In Afghanistan, if I were to ask a Taliban right now, right, these questions, they're not probably going to shy away. I mean, there was a David Hikachu debate recently. He probably won't shy away. He'll probably be like, you know, honest in saying, yes, this is what it says. And yes, unless you convert, this is the way it is. What, why do you think Muslims are not saying that this is what the text is saying do you think they're trying to appeal to the west and convince them to convert so they're going to manipulate or lie or they believe this themselves so giving them the credit of honesty but are like kind of changing what it means well, i can't speak about muslims i can only speak about what the doctrine is you right. see the difference here i don't you'll notice that i've never said anything bad about a muslim i've never even said muhammad was a bad person for advising you to deceive i'm just saying he did that that's part of what I do. I don't condemn. I don't deal with Muslims at all. I just deal with what the doctrine is. 
So okay. what your Muslim friend thinks or doesn't think is beyond me. I mean, he's a person. I can't read his mind, but I can read the mind of Muhammad because we have the Sarah, his biography, and the Hadith, his traditions. Mm. Are, you, are you beginning to see my method? Yeah. It's I'm very text-based. Now, in your books you've written, do you go into all of this in oh, much yes. greater detail? Oh, yes. Have you had anyone write criticisms? And I'm not talking about against you as a person saying you're far right wing think tank. You're you're this, yeah, you're that, you're neo-Nazi, you're something. Yeah, like they that. say that. I've yeah, been but, called every name in the book. But you know, one you, of the things that puzzles me, why I, I'm an old man and I was raised with a little jingle sing song we used to say Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. And I was raised in a culture in which people were very blunt speaking. You may have noticed I, yeah. I inculcated some of that. That's why I asked if you were military, because a lot of military men are like that. I just speak direct to the point. But you'll notice I also don't get angry. I don't condemn. Who have I condemned? I've condemned no one. And by the way, so far as knowing, Islamic State knows more about Islam than any other group I've seen, they read, they write in, they have a magazine called Inspire, I believe. And what they write in there, it's like they're supreme scholars. I find the jihadis know Islam better than the non jihadis. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, this is a uh, definitely heavy stuff. I highly yeah. recommend anyone who's serious about this to check out what you've written to see you know, if they want to go and critique, I'd like to see people try. Have you had anyone write material over against potentially some of your work? And the reason I ask real quick, Bill, if you don't mind, is this. People can rhetorically say, oh, you're this, you're that. And just like they want to poison the well to say no one should listen to a word you're saying. You're just a hateful old man who doesn't like this uh, religion, they'll call it. Of course, you'd say it's political, maybe a mix of both either way. Um, but have you ever had someone actually try to take your work, what you're saying about the Quran, the Hadith, and whatnot, and say you're wrong about that and try to pick apart your interpretations? No, they're always broad brush. They're like, well, you don't read Arabic or something like that. Or you're just, you're just a bigot and a hater. But they don't argue doctrine with me. And why are they going to say there aren't 13 verses that say that the Kafir is never the true friend of a Muslim? What are they going to do? For one thing, when I deal with Muslims, they've never had that sort of 61, the Quran, Sir and Hadith is 84% about Muhammad and only 14% about Allah. They've never met anybody that gives them stats like that. So that leaves them sort of just slightly disoriented. It's like you're in martial arts and you're fighting somebody who uses a whole different style of fighting than you've ever seen before. And by the way, I enjoy challenges. Well, and I, by the way, let me say this. Back when I was used to be doing pre-COVID, did a lot of talks. One of the things I admired about Muslims, and there are some things I admire about them, is that they would boldly come. You have a thousand Christians at a church and two to three Muslims would show up to ask questions. You'll never find uh, an event which is Islamic and two or three Christians be the only ones there. So Muslims have some qualities I admire. Oddly enough, since I'm an old man, they're generally polite and respectful to, old, to elders, which is not so true of the younger generation of Americans. Wow. That was a uh, really well put. Um, I think that a lot of people lack a backbone and uh, they don't really believe in what they're actually, you know, going around saying, or at least they don't have too, con too much confidence in it. Apostate Prophet super chatted us here. And, uh, oh, I love him. Yeah. He says, much respect to Dr. Bill Warner. Happy to see that he is healthy and active. Thank you for your work, Derek. Appreciate I admire, you. I admire him. Yeah, he's he's a really, really good guy. Um, I enjoy what he's doing, and I've worked with him recently on his channel. And, and he has a backbone. Yeah. He's got cojones. <laughs> for those who don't know what those are, they are male testicles. All right. Greg um, Konowitz, I hope I'm... Uh, pronouncing your name correct, my friend. He says, what are they going to do? They are going to super uh, sugarcoat the verses in the Quran to make Islam look peaceful when it's not. Islam is Orwellian by nature. Would you like to comment on that? Well, he's referring here to dualism is what it amounts to. And look, 
as you can imagine, I don't like dualism personally as a thing, but I just observe that that's the doctrine is dualistic. It's not my personal choice. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be in near the trouble I am if I were if I were sugarcoating. Yeah. But why not speak the truth? What's wrong with that? The fact that it makes some somebody un, unhappy. Well, the truth often makes people unhappy. You've mentioned the, the New Testament. I believe that Jesus said a lot of things were true that made a lot of people unhappy. What discourages me about Christians today are they're not willing to stand against the tide. Right. You know, and by I the way, if you haven't offended anybody who's powerful, what is your life worth? I, I, I mean, want to say this for everybody on the chat too, though. I want to give, and you're going to, you're going to like take my words probably out of context here, but AP's in the chat. So is my friend Abdullah Samir, which he has another, he's called the ex-friendly Muslim or a uh, friendly ex-Muslim, sorry, uh, is his channel. Really, really cool guy. Um, they recently took some clips from a debate between this guy named uh, David. Is it David or Daniel Hikachu Hick something? I don't know. I totally butchered his name. He says things that the West, if they listen, they're going to go, what? Child marriages, beat your wife, employees should be beaten by their bosses, sex slavery, slavery, all of this. He doesn't shy away. He goes and says, this is the teaching, and he justifies it in his worldview. He's you got to give someone like that, as much as I totally despise everything he stands for, okay, I give that man credit for at least saying what he actually believes, and he's trying to be true to his text and not try to obfuscate what is actually being said. I agree with you. Mm. Thank you. Well, I don't want us to be an echo chamber here. We have 29 minutes. Right. You, you, I, mean I, I haven't, you mean I haven't voiced my opinion strongly enough yet? No, no. <laughs> I'm just saying I, you and me, I think, are in much of the same book. I approach this. I don't believe this. Right. I don't believe Allah. I don't believe Muhammad is a prophet. Uh, I believe there's a way to probably look at this and find out how this man-made religion developed. Do you think and, – and this is something because you say it's political Islam – what if you look at the historical man, and I don't know, this is a question I guess worth asking. Do you think there was a historical Muhammad? <sighs> I had to open up the can of worms because now we get off into the, now we get off into the weeds. I don't want to get too far off, but I just no, kind no, of no, no, no. let me let me say this. I do not believe what's in the Sirah is true. The Sirah, the biography of Muhammad, is recorded nearly 200 years after he died. Do you believe we actually know what color camel he rode when he went to wherever? I don't believe that. 200 years later, come on. It's more like we're writing the first biography of George Washington. We're just going around collecting stories that have been rattling around in the corners of the world. We might get some things right about George Washington, but we wouldn't sure get, get all the details right. I grew up in a very rural part area of Tennessee called Appalachia. And one of the things, amusements, believe it or not, there was a time before television. I know it's hard to believe, but what we told stories. My grandmother told me stories. And so I, as a storyteller, I see that stories are embellished the more they're told. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah I agree. So 200 years later, I believe there's a lot of embellishment. But do I believe the Muhammad existed? Somebody like him did. But no, I don't believe the story is true. But here's what I do. Muslims do say it's the Syria is true. They do say the Hadith is true. And so I accept their, I accept their hypothesis and right. go from there. Okay. So we've accepted he's historical based on their hypothesis. It's will no, no point in arguing against that. We allow Robert Spencer to do that. So we'll move on. All right. So you and me say he existed as far as the, the origin of this religion, political movement. What do you think happened? Do you, do you think what do you think, if there was a guy, what do you think happened that actually caused the development of this thing? I have an answer for that. Muhammad was the most brilliant warrior who ever lived. He created an entire new form of warfare called civilizational war. The hijab is part of a weapon of war. Halal food is part of a weapon. He used everything that human beings do, sex, everything that human beings do, he incorporated it into his concept of war. His war is unlimited war. So he was the greatest warrior who ever lived. Hmm. Does that make sense? I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty intense. That's pretty intense. Um, Have I bored you yet? Huh? 
Have I bored you yet? No, I don't think you could bore me. I, I don't know if it's even possible for you to bore me. Uh, it's just not even possible. I could be dead asleep and I'd wake up to the things you're saying right now. Uh, it's really intense. Okay. I guess it's good to get into some of the traditions here, maybe to get your opinion on some stuff. I just did an interview with Shadi Nasir. You said you didn't know who he was. Dr. Nasir's Islamic expert. And we were talking about the contradictions within the tradition of the development of how they came to come with the Quran. And we have, um, who's the uh, Abu Bakr, right? He's, he's out here trying to collect the Quran. As far as the development of the Quran in their tradition, one of the, what is it? Zaid, I think it is said like, why do I need to collect the Quran if the prophet himself didn't do that? But then there's Correct. other traditions that say, no, he had scribes that wrote these things down. There seems to be problems within the narrative of how the Quran even came to be. What do you think happened? Well, first off, let's take the Hadith. There's no way that anybody could memorize all of them. I mean, it simply cannot. It's not humanly possible. Now, there are Muslims who've, who have memorized the Quran, but the Quran they've ever memorized is classical Arabic. And that doesn't mean they understand what it says. I mean, I can I know some Sanskrit. I can give you uh, quotations and I mean, mantra and sanskrit and I, i'm saying the words but i you i have no idea what they mean so that is the way that most muslims are as a matter of fact islam does not encourage questioning asking questions about islam islam is orthopraxic that is you're judged on what you do not how you think and feel hmm yeah, I've noticed that uh, and the judgment that they would get after in the afterlife is based on that as well. It's very right. So they're not real keen on, on on study of the doctrine. Besides that, that's the mullah's job. So they just do what they're told. That's what they're encouraged to do. Critical thought is not encouraged. This is an important fact. Islam, the Sharia and us are mutually contradictory. You cannot have both of them together. Our cornerstone of ethics is the golden rule. Do unto others you would have them do unto you. Islam's ethics are based on dualism. If you're a Kafir, you're treated one way. If you're a Muslim, you're treated another way. You're a brother to a Muslim. But a Kafir is useful only as much as you can use him. So there are contradictions. The other thing is our intellectual basis of all thought is critical thought, which I find being abandoned today, and it greatly disturbs me, particularly in journalism. But in Islam, there's no critical thought. You have to think within the box of Quran, Sirah, Hadith. Okay? You can't go outside that. So therefore, Islam is not very good at critical thought. I give you the idea of, of uh, Nobel Prizes. There's never been a Nobel Prize granted in the sciences to any Muslim who was working in a Muslim country. There's some Muslims who shared a Nobel Prize, but they were working with Kafirs and in Kafir nations. So Islam is not keen on, as a matter of fact, the idea of innovation is a dirty word, literally. Huh. So, so we don't have the same ethical cornerstone. What is the compromise between dualistic ethics and the golden rule? There's no stool in the middle. Do you follow me? You're one or the other. So those who believe that we can have a multicultural United States in which Islam is here doing what it wants to do and we can continue to exist, the Sharia commands it to be the rule of all peoples. So what's happening is, is we're slowly becoming Islamicized. Let's take 9-11, which surely we said never forget. Well, what's happening now is the Muslim Brotherhood starts sending out to the media. You know, this whole business of, uh, is, is offensive to us when you remember this, and it causes Islamophobia. So you need to instead have 9-11 be a day of cultural sharing where everybody wears the hijab just to see what that's like and so forth. So we're not, we're not doing what we should be doing and even remembering our own history. Hmm. So, and what's amazing to me is, is that people say, well, you know, you're right. Muslims shouldn't be offended. But if the truth offends you, get out. I, back to the question, though, about how you think we got our Quran. Do you think this is just a collection of ideas that oh, yes. later... Uh, well, when you read it, it's very clear. I can... You give me a high school class, give me a half hour's time to lecture with them, and let them use a cheat sheet that is just a three by five card I, they'll be able to pick out 98% of all the Quran verses that are written in Mecca and Medina. They're that different. The early verses, which are short, are somewhat poetic. But the latter, the longest verse in the Quran is a, is a verse on contract law, 
we can easily just separate that out from, say, a short verse in the, the early Quran. So anybody can learn the difference. They're that different. Well, if they're that different, that may indicate origin, different sources, does it not? It would indicate at least different authors. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. At or at least uh, different things really, if not, things really changed for the first author. You know, that, that would be. Right. Uh, <laughs> This is interesting. I like to get into the textual stuff too, to kind of like point out how something could easily be developed. Cause that's one of the biggest foundational claims I hear is, well, the Quran is a miracle. And I'm like, people, you're telling me people couldn't write that, couldn't make this up using surrounding ideas from Judaism, Christianity, Zoroastrianism, and pre Islamic Arabic or, uh, you know, Arabic cults and whatnot that were around the Kaaba and whatnot. That's, that's, uh, that's what I'm saying. That's it makes the most sense to me. Not that Gabriel really came down and orated this to, to Muhammad in a cave, uh, gave him this this book. So you have any to, any thoughts on that whole uh, ordeal with him uh, in a cave idea? Or do you think this is just a created narrative? What do you think? I think it's a created narrative. It's what I call, the name of your channel is Myth Vision. I use the word myth, not in a negative, you're telling lies sense. But a myth is something like, a great story that form that helps to form civilization. So I believe their their creation myth is that just that it's a creation myth, and it does reflect the idea that Muhammad himself did not leave it behind, which is sort of odd if you think about it. Hmm. But it definitely developed over time. We know that because of the hadith in which Ali says, "I can give you the time and place for every verse that was revealed." What is since he's a man, he was living through time. And so if he can name everyone, that means the Quran of all through time. Do you follow me? Right, right. And this is supposed to be a message for all time, for all people. But it's kind of, it's sort of funny when you it's sort of funny when you're reading the Quran and you realize something said was earlier. It's kind of like you, you want to say it to Allah. Come on, man, can you make your mind up? I mean, you didn't know that in the beginning. If you were talking to a Muslim right now and they were able to have a friendly conversation with you and you were going to attempt to try and convince him look man this this isn't true like you think what would be the first thing you because everyone's different right you're pretty right. bold how would you approach a muslim who was saying you know they wanted to convince you but they're willing to, they're open to dialogue and you were trying to say look man this is not something you should this is why i think it's not true and this is something i would want to convince you of how would you go about doing it Simple. I would follow the methods of a man who is a Methodist minister in Australia who as individual, as one person, converted 2,400 Muslims to Christianity. And how does he do it? He asks questions. He asks questions that point out the paradoxes. And then he dwells on the paradox so you resolve it in some way or another. Then he moves on with another question. It's a process that takes about two hours, and it's what it is is the, the Socratic method, asking questions. I learned that early on because the things I had to say with it, even my friends were like, Bill, come on, man, that can't be true. Well, it is true. So I discovered the most powerful argument was not to tell anybody anything, but simply ask questions. Well put, actually. I'm glad you responded that way because I'm big into the whole Socratic method is definitely it's a very way powerful. Of, it is. And it, it allows them to show their epistemology but also make them maybe look at their own foundations as to why they even conclude what they do. Which most of them have not done. Right. Right. Okay. So NW89, thank you for the super chat. We do have 17, 16 to 17 minutes, guys. I got to cut it off sharp at 60 minute mark. So if you have any questions, super chat them in and I'll ask Dr. Bill Warner. We should stop framing the debate in terms of peacefulness and Christian slave morality and ask why Christians lost so much Hellenized land to Islam. So now well, the history is very clear about that. They came with a sword. And Christians morale morale was to try not to fight. They tried different strategies. Some of them took longer than others. They had um, a Christian had three choices after Islam entered. He could convert, he could die, or he could pay the jizya, which is the tax. Now we know that the tax, the jizya tax, was the most powerful part of the economy of the Muslim world. Why? Because Ali said one time he was the son-in-law of Muhammad and his cousin. 
So it tells you something about the genetics in that part of the world. I won't get off into that. Uh, what, like in, inbred, you mean? Like Yes. Right. Because the Quran says that first cousins can be married. And if you do a whole generation after generation of marrying your first cousin, some things happen which are very cruel to the, to the baby. Genetically, right. Yes. Well, now, hey, was, don't feel bad. People in West Virginia have done this. So so there's nothing to shy away from. Yeah, you can be blunt. YouTube shied away from it. Who? YouTube. Oh, you must have made like a specific video on this topic, didn't you? I did. Uh-oh. Look, I've been censored by the best. Interesting. I've been censored by Google. Let me, let, can I tell you the story of my censorship? Because it's, it's true yeah, of everybody. Yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, and if we get a super chat, I might interrupt you. I'll pop it up on the screen. That's quite know. all right. Okay. I was booming along. My book on Sharia law was number one bestseller on Amazon. If you Google political Islam, the top three screens were all about me. That's impossible to achieve that kind of dominance. But since I created the term, I did. YouTube, I was booming along so much that YouTube assigned me a special trainer. They said, you're getting great responses, but you don't know what you're doing with videos. So we, they gave me for six weeks a YouTuber who would, I had their phone number. I'd pick it up and call. They immediately answered and answered my question and gave me things to learn that I needed wow. to know. That is acceptance. Then in the Southern Poverty Law Center declared me to be a hate-filled bigot. And at uh, Media Matters, a Soros group in Florida, they stood up and said, we've tried shaming these people, but it doesn't work. We have to drive them out of business. Immediately, my bestseller on Amazon disappeared. Uh, I was demonetized. MasterCard sent me a letter saying I can no longer use their logo. PayPal canceled me. Uh, oh, two thirds of those references to me on Google disappeared. So I know what censorship is. I've experienced it. And it was all all this happened to me within a two month period of time. So I went along from running a booming little publishing business to one that was like below water. Hmm. So that's what it's like to be to to, uh, to offend our great masters in the digital world. I'm not a fan of Facebook. They oh they they shadow ban me. Twitter Twitter shadow bans me. So I've you're friends hard. with everyone, aren't you? Oh yeah, no 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> wow it seems like you even have some fans in the chat let's see um <laughs> let's see we have we have some people definitely in the chat that are definitely not fans of you is my point i'm being sarcastic and they, they, there's definitely on. some people who don't like you for sure bring them on <laughs> <laughs> bring it on bring your questions go ahead bring your questions we've got 12 minutes left ladies and gentlemen um, if for whatever reason, Abdullah Samir or, uh, AP, one of you guys have a specific question, I'll be happy to ask, of course, but if anyone else does too, shoot it my way, let me know. Um, I've got 12 minutes with Dr. Bill Warner, Bill, I came across your stuff a long time ago, I must admit, but I didn't really care. I, I didn't really care, um, to get into this whole topic till recently. It's really wasn't even an interest of mine. I just thought, well, it's just Islam, you know, it's, it's, it's never really crossed path. I have a lot of uh, Muslims who actually watch my material who love to see me poke into the New Testament critically or into the Old Testament critically. They love watching that stuff. They're like, yes. And I now see why, because in their worldview, in their mindset, those scriptures are corrupt. Those right. aren't accurate. Right. So, so they're, they're, okay the only ones that, they're the only ones that have the accurate story of Moses, Abraham, and all the others. And, and by the way, they're also tell the only true story about Jesus. Right. They right, say that right. Jesus is in the Quran, but it's not Jesus. It's Isa, who's another creature. Huh. Interesting. Do you, what, do you have any clue in your um, research where you think the Isa narrative comes from? Like, do you think yes. it's borrowed? Yes, Gospel of Thomas. Okay, okay. So it was definitely we, from... Yeah, and we have to understand something here. This this fight has has been put to rest, but it, for the first several centuries of Christianity, there were the ongoing question was, what is the true nature of Christ? Now there are many Christians, including, did you ever ask yourself the question after Christ died, why weren't there any Jewish Christians? Because everyone was Jewish. That was that was in everyone you see in the New Testament is a Jew, right. right? What happened to those people? Well, it turns out they created another form of Christianity, which was 
a, in which Jesus was a messenger. He was not a trend. He was not part of the Trinity. And this helped to influence the creation of Islam because it's very non-Trinitarian. Allah gets all huffy when you start talk, talking about the Trinity and Jesus being the son of God. Right. Yeah, I have my own thoughts on that, but I don't want to go there in this episode. I specifically do, though, realize that they were using literature, even like infancy gospels and such that are not uh, canonical to Christians. And um, that there's there's the theories that this came out of a, a fringe type Christian sect that may have been brushing shoulders with them in Mecca or around this place, Medina, Um I don't know how true some of these theories are. I've got a list of books. I think I showed you. I've got Ibn Warwick, uh, The Origins of the Quran. I'm getting into corrections in early Quran manuscripts. I'm going to be reading Robert Spencer, Did Muhammad Exist? Just to have a fun episode on that. Because a lot of people wonder if even Jesus existed, right? Which that's not the topic of our episode here. But to make the point, um, Christians are pretty open to that criticism. But I hear that like... You can't be too critical of Muhammad. You can't be too critical. Of- it's called blasphemy. Right. If I, isn't if, it if, blasphemy to Christians too? I mean, to, what I mean is... Yeah, but it, you have they, a they Christians have a different... I think there's a slightly different way it's handled. Right. If you blaspheme Jesus, nothing. you don't expect anything to happen. But I challenge you to go to Pakistan and blaspheme Muhammad. Oh, well, definitely. You're going to be beheaded for that, probably. Yeah. Or just beat to death. Or that, yeah. Or shot. Mm. But it's all bad. What do we do with this, Bill? What do we do with um, just being able to open up criticism or to uh, what have you learned in all your trials being censored and whatnot? Like, how do you handle that in light of the situation you're in? Well, most people don't want to deal with it. The reason is is able to believe that all religions have some good in them, although there's the atheists who say oh, no religion is any good at all. They have those two polar opposites. So why I say to them is disturbing, and people don't want to be disturbed. So I'm not very popular in the sense that I don't want to know that. No, 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 no. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to hear that. Just let's not talk about it. That's people's usual reaction to what I have to say. It's not that I'm wrong. They don't care what right and wrong is. They just don't want to talk about it because the implications are too big. If I'm true when I say that Sharia civilization contradicts ours and the two can't coexist, all of a sudden that means, well, what are we going to do about the Muslims that are here? I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to think about that. Yeah. So I'm not a very popular person. You know, I I recently helped a Muslim who's struggling with fentanyl addiction. I had him in my house for 30 days. We had some friendly conversations. He disagreed with me. He said, Derek, you should go back to becoming a Christian because at least you're a people of the book. Right. And that's what he said. So at least become a people of the book and stop being what you are, which I'm an atheist by definition. I I like to feel I'm not a hateful atheist, uh, but I definitely... Um, I'm no longer a Christian. I'm, I fall in that category. But the point is, I brought him into my house. He doesn't seem to be aware of these things you're talking about. I think most Muslims in the West aren't really aware of the things you're describing here. Self-examination is not considered to be part of Islam. Hmm. We have a super chat. Osri Schizophrenia. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. <laughs> Dr. Bill, so do you believe social network prefer profit? hate speech policy over truth. What can we do about it? I think is what they mean to say. So I don't know what we can do about it. Do you realize that there are basically five people who control 80% of all communications in the world? They're basically the heading up of Apple, Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and whatever else that cannot end. Well, what does the multi, what does the multi-billionaire know about me? Nothing. If I'm annoying, he just, shadow bans me. Hmm. So I don't see that any, anything we can do. We've had an internal revolution here. And let me say this, out of all the rights of the constitution, the most valuable right you can have is freedom of speech, freedom right. of ideas. Cause if you can't have those, forget about religion, forget about gun control, forget about anything. So the yeah. most powerful thing is free speech. And we now have five people who control 80% of all speech. That's not, it, it can't work out well. 
Okay, we got another super chat here. I'm sorry, you told me you only have 60 minutes, so I have to keep uh, my my word to you. Stop scamming, man. You always come through, brother. Thank you. I appreciate the super chat. If I recall correctly, the infancy gospel never really went out of circum circulation, sorry, like other texts, giving alternatives to the New Testament. Also, I recommend asking Harris Sultan about blasphemy in Pakistan if he's ever on. Do you know who that is? No. Harris, email me, brother. Email me. You always are super chatting me. Derek at MythVisionPodcast.com in the description, bro. Like, definitely I'll be interested in looking him up. So let me ask you this, Bill. I got to ask you since everyone thinks you're a bigot that's a practicing Muslim. Um, and notice there are people on the far left as well that would be like, yeah, he's a bigot because you're speaking so bold about something that they're like, no, 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 no. I have 20 Muslim friends who don't believe what you're saying. And that might be true. The point is you're trying to go back to the text. You're trying to go back to these. And then if it became a majority country and they can enforce what their texts teach, you're saying that Sharia does not look pretty at all. Nothing like the West. So my question is this to you. Do you encourage? I know you wish the religion was somehow abolished in a way or somehow it no longer existed because you just don't like this religion. I, too, find very big problems with this religion. I also see problems with other religions, and I think we as humans have more we can do than just have to go to ancient texts to figure these things out. That's my personal opinion. But I want to ask you this. Do you think a Muslim who's being progressive, do you encourage that in some way, shape, or form at least to try and say, look, if I can't change their ideologies, right, like they, ha they believe in the Quran, but they're willing to say, we don't believe in the Hadith anymore. Bill, Bill, I understand. I'm against the Taliban. I'm against ISIS. I personally find truth in the Quran. I don't accept, you know, these other texts and the, the the hateful things. I'm willing to say that these passages you say are bad. I'm interpreting them as not bad, and I want most Muslims to do so. So, if they're not willing to let go of Islam, would you at least encourage, in some way, shape, or form, and say, you know what, if you're going to go in that path? So be it. If I can't get people to, to change and not believe anymore, I think that people who are at least trying to pacify the religion, uh, mystify the religion, allegorize the religion, and I use the word religion a lot there, but I'm trying to because in the West, it doesn't seem they're as political as what we see in Islamic states. So my question is, what do you, what do you think? Do you think that's encouraging we should do that? I think that if they're going to be a Muslim, they need to know what being a Muslim means in full score. Look, and there's a verse in the Quran that says, today I have perfected your religion. And what you're saying is, well, as be a Muslim, you need to just leave part of it off. Allah says, I have perfected your religion, and it includes the Quran of Mecca and the Quran of Medina. So which is it? You are Allah. So, I mean, if they're... If it, are you suggesting that you will you're trying to make them face the truth of the text that they have? Yes. So what if they're what if they're like I just don't interpret it that way. I want to try and get others to do that. Would you encourage a mission like that? I would encourage them to discuss. There is something called the Quran only school. Right. In which they try to get rid of the hadith and the sirah. What do they do with the 89 verses which say they're supposed to copy? Is they're supposed to pray, but how do they pray? They're supposed to get the zakat, the tax, but how do they use it? So without the, uh, the hadith, you cannot practice Islam. You can't even pray. The hadith say that you pray five times a day. The Quran says you pray three times a day. It's resolved in the case by five times a day. So Muhammad here trumps Allah. So that's the way it works. So, I mean, I, the question, just simply put, I guess a yes or no, you would encourage people to head in a more... Uh, a westernized mindset though would you at least do that much since they're no. not willing to let go so no. what, why i just say this is this is the totality of what you believe how why don't you believe all of it you do not believe that allah actually perfected your religion then you're then you're not really a muslim at all you're a hypocrite <laughs> whoa bill Come on. Don't you at least grant people trying to allegorize? I mean, look, for example, I'll give you one example. Bad example here. We got a few minutes. Um, there are some Christians who don't accept the resurrection, right? Uh, they they literally start to go, okay, I think these are stories. Now okay. you might go, that's not a true Christian. And I agree with you, by the way, okay? A true Christian, one that believes that this is true. He died and rose again. 
I don't want to get lost in this, but I just want to make the point. They're wanting to allegorize. And in my head, I'm like, dude, why do you believe it at all at this point? At this point, if you're actually wanting to say it's just a story about your inside inner man and the chakras or whatever, whatever it might be, I don't care how you want to do this. If you don't believe he died and rose again, you're not a Christian technically. But it's like, I wish they would just uh, leave it all together at that point if they're going to start doing that. But if they're causing physical harm and, for example, if there was a religion, political religion, that was causing damage so much so that people are trying to westernize and pacify the religion because they're not willing to leave it, you're saying you don't, you don't encourage that at all. You're saying either black or white in your head, right? When I read the text, that's what it says. <clears throat> okay. You're an unwavering man on this topic. I understand. <laughs> I, I don't discuss other religions. I came here to talk about political Islam. Yes, sir. I just wanted to bring an example. No, no, no. I know. Yeah, yeah. I, so, the reason I don't ever discuss other religions is once you get off into the weeds, you'll never come back alive. I understand that. So real quick, Uber, is it Scheiser? I hope I'm saying that right. I know in uh, German that could be a, a bad name, I heard. Uh, here is a five spot for you, Derek, to help make up for the fact that this video will be demonetized by the man. Well, I appreciate the love, man. Thanks for <laughs> Bill. We're at our hour mark. I seriously appreciate you joining me. Um, well, I had fun. Yeah, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. I did, too. Um, I'm going to continue asking educated scholars. I'm going to have Muslim scholars coming onto my channel in the future to share where they're coming from. Of course, they're probably totally going to disagree with everything that you actually said to some degree, I would think. Um, but what would you say as we leave encouraging words on this topic before we let you go? We need to examine our intellectual roots and realize it's based on critical thought. We need to know what we're talking about. So therefore, I'm a teacher. All I do is I say, I want you to know what Allah said, what Muhammad said and did. That's all I want. Make up your own mind. But first, know what the facts are. So that's all I'm about. I'm an educator. Thank you, Dr. Bill Warner. I appreciate you. Ladies and gentlemen, join Mythician's Patreon. Lots of stuff with Dr. Shadi Nasir on Islam, as well as a lot of other stuff that I get into. You guys can join and check out all that stuff early. You help support me, ask questions. Political Islam is the YouTube channel where Bill Warner is at, as well as his website, which is politicalislam.com. You can tell that he's a bold man, and he's definitely in the puddle of controversy when it comes to these topics. I mean, really, I did not, I didn't know that this would be this front, this bold, you know? So, uh, Bill, good luck. I mean, you, you, hopefully you live as long as possible and um, can continue to give this uh, information out to people. I wish there were people who spoke had actual texts that were critical instead of you're a liar, you're right wing, you're, you're uh, Islamophobe, bigot, this, this, that. If they think all of that, okay, whatever. I would be interested in any critical response to your work other than derogatory words that kind of poison the well from engaging in the content itself. Because to me, it's like you, when I talk to you, you don't like Islam. Got it. So what? I don't like Islam, but it's not in that maybe in the sense that they would try to say you, I don't know. I don't understand. I don't, I don't personally, I like learning about the myths and the narratives, but as far as the religion itself, I mean, I could do that with other religions, right? I, I don't Notice like something very religion. carefully. What we've done here. Is there a single person that I have ever condemned, made fun of, mocked or anything else? I do not deal with people. I just deal with the ideas in a text. Think over, go over there, your mind while we've done. If I ever said that Islam is bad, if I ever said Muhammad was bad, if I ever said a Muslim is bad because they belong to Islamic State. As a matter of fact, if you listen to what I said about Islamic State is I complimented them. They write the clearest, most transparent defense of the doctrine of jihad that I've ever read. So I call Muhammad. Did I condemn him? I said, no, he's the greatest warrior who ever lived. Hmm. Listen carefully to what I say. Interesting. James Scott says, hey, Myth Vision, to tell whether a modern Muslim scholar or Bill Warner is right, just check what the classical books of Islamic law say. Well Reliance said. of the Traveler, a Sharia text. I agree with the man. Interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, I love you guys. Seriously, appreciate you, Bill. Let's do this again sometime. And Anytime. Uh, this is what I do. 
Yes, sir. Never forget that, ladies and gentlemen. Check them out. Everything's in the description. And never forget, we are Mythvision. Ha, 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 ha,